Welcome everybody. You're watching We Heart Therapy, the special series EFT Talk. I'm your host, Dr. Bell, licensed marriage and family therapist and certified EFT supervisor and community leader of the Southern Nevada EFT community here in fabulous Las Vegas, Nevada. And I'm extremely excited to welcome today, we have Sandra Taylor. She is one of the founders of the British Center for EFT, and she also serves as the director, and she helps run together with Robert Allen, uh, the LGBTQ-centered externships and core skills, and she helps train in Poland, and she's really doing amazing, amazing work out there in uh, England. She lives in the northwest area of England, so she says it's about an hour from Manchester. Not sure if everyone will know where that is, but nonetheless, we're so excited to have her on our channel, and we are going to be talking about how to work with double trauma within the context of our couples therapy sessions using emotionally focused therapy. So, Sandra, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah, it's great to be here. It's wonderful. And so if we want to just get some the folks kind of started off when we're talking about trauma and maybe at first you could you offer maybe a general overview of what we mean when we say trauma and then what do we mean by double trauma? Okay. Okay. So first of all, I just wanted to add to that wonderful introduction that you had there for me. And um, in, in terms of my identity, um, some of the things that are kind of key, if you like, are that I'm white, that I'm a cis woman, um, that I'm lesbian, and that I'm disabled, um, that I'm a widow of a deeply loving 20 year relationship. I'm British. Yeah, and those are just a few little bits of kind of labels, if you like, that, that help sort of see my identity. And they are part of, you know, who I am as I'm doing all my work. You know, they influence my work and they influence working with trauma, trauma couples. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when I'm thinking about trauma, I'm thinking about something that has been incredibly overwhelming that hasn't been processed fully, that comes into the relationships. So we're often talking, when we're talking about it in this context, we're talking about childhood traumas. Um, it could be traumas that are later, it could be traumas within the relationship, but mostly we're talking about the ones that really impact the attachment style and how people view themselves and each other. So, you know, not everybody's had traumas, which is a lovely thing to, to think of because uh, I work a lot with people who, who have. Um, and sometimes one person has got big traumas and the other one hasn't. And then you get some couples who've got some big traumas um, and they kind of interface with each other in ways that make it really tricky to be vulnerable and safe with each other. It's a beautiful, beautiful um, way to see trauma and, and curious. So for those who might be wondering, would we consider, so I know there's a lot of discussion about this. And I think of Gabor Mate saying trauma isn't just what happened to you. It's what happens inside of you as a result of what happens to you. But in working with trauma clients myself, I've come to learn that Again, some some trauma isn't as obvious to us. Like it's not as obvious as I had this horrific car accident or I was mugged or had a rape or, you know, something like a traumatic event. Um, and I almost feel like sometimes those traumas that come from less obvious events can almost be more insidious because it's like it doesn't give us a frame to really understand or do justice to the impact of what's happened. Could you talk a little bit more about those kinds of traumas? Yes. I mean, when I'm talking about this kind of client work, I would include that kind of broader concept of it. I know some people will only use it in terms of overwhelming um, in those broader way, in those more specific ways that you would look and think, of course, that's traumatic. But for lots of people, they've had events that have overwhelmed their system. 
And that's been, you know, omission and commission. Yeah, so a child's repeated experience of not being seen in the world, of only being there as an object for their, you know, caregivers, um, does something deep and overwhelming to them and, you know, brings lots of issues around, am I lovable? Can I ever be seen? Who am I? You know, I must always be there for other people. Yeah, so, yes, I'm with you, with the fact that it can be... Um, much more subtle, if you like, but profoundly overwhelming. Yeah, absolutely. And how would a therapist, so I know not all clients come in recognizing that what they've experienced is trauma or even willing to put the word trauma around that experience. How would a therapist recognize that this is the dynamic that they might be seeing with the client? Mm. Well, the individual sessions obviously really help because we're talking about their, you know, earlier life experiences. And we're talking about things like, you know, belonging and not belonging and events in their childhood and their sense of their their childhood. Um, so you'll usually get a good flavor of the, 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 you know, the experiences that they've had and how they have started to impact the way that they see the world. They might not use the word trauma. As you say, some people have got loads of insight and have done loads of therapy and are coming with lots of awareness um, and wanting to eagerly be able to work with it. Um, whereas for others, it's like they've never really, you know, taken it on board. They've never kind of, and they don't want to. You know, I, I remember working with a client who for a long time, he just refused to um, connect with what, his traumatic childhood because he said that then becomes an excuse for when I don't, you know, get things right as an adult and I don't want to live like that. Mm. Yeah. So sometimes there is a resistance to to the compassion for one's history and its impact. Um, not as something that, you know, means that you can get away with everything if you like, you know, but is an understanding of, of course, of course you find it hard to be safe around that. Of course you react to that. Yeah, look at what happened to you. Yeah. So it sounds like really knowing the client's attachment history can help us understand and I found also, again, for those clients who maybe you've done their attachment history, but then you find out later, sometimes if they're doing couples therapy, the spouse will say, well, didn't they tell you about this thing that happened? And they might not have told yeah. us because for them, it didn't really occur that it might be relevant or important. So um, I find when you find yourself being on the receiving end of what feels like disorganized attachment, that's that's a clue. Yes. Yeah, you're seeing disorganized attachment happening, then you know that that something's gone on that's been serious and that has really impacted the way they are in relationship. Yes. Yeah. And for those who might be looking for sort of a, a general clinical definition of disorganized attachment, just so we can all be on the same page, would you be willing to share how we look at disorganized attachment with NEFT? Hmm. Well, I tend to look at it just very simply, really, and it, and it's it's when somebody is shifting from the more pursuing to the more withdrawing partner. So we'll often see it with somebody who's saying, you know, come, 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 I want, I want you, I want you, I want you, and then as soon as the other person moves forward, it's like it's too much, it's overwhelming, and you push them away. Mm -hmm. And so there's that kind of flipping of positions, which can be extremely confusing and distressing for the yeah. partner and obviously for the therapist, if the therapist isn't catching hold of this. Yeah. yeah oftentimes um, there might be quick to offer clinical labels like borderline personality disorder and such, but really we're looking at trauma. And mm -hmm. I think about it in the way that it's like, you know, and I find one of them at the heart, I'm not saying this is always how it's created, but a general trend that I've found 
is a lot of inconsistencies to their attachment experiences from their caregivers. So they don't really know. They weren't able to form a predictable, coherent baseline as to what causes my caregiver to come towards me and care for me and what causes them to go away. So I never really know you know, where I stand in either direction. So I'm always having to be on alert for and trying different things to try to bring about the attachment that we all need, but always leery, suspicious, afraid of of what could cause them to go away and not really knowing what it could be or sort of on edge thinking it could be anything. It could be saying the wrong thing. It could be looking funny, you know, it could be you know, whatever it could be a lot of things. And so really puts them, I say, it's kind of like the the gas and the brake are confused and they don't really know if they're going or coming. And, and it's, it's a really tough way to have to move about the world. It is. And, and that's a good way of saying it. And, and, and you're talking there about, you know, not knowing how the, the caregiver is, is going to be with them. And that's not just about withdrawal, of course, it's also about danger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, you know, their caregiver might be somebody who is sometimes safe and fun and loving and other times is, you know, abusive or shouting or, mm -hmm. you know, in other ways behaving in unsafe ways. Mm -hmm. And so there's there's that kind of paradox for the person, isn't there? It's like I want closeness and intimacy, but actually that's really dangerous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah and, and I love how Sue... Um, has also talked about in trauma that it, it can be something that redefines our attachment system. So even if you grew up with secure attachment, you could have a significant love relationship with somebody who might have had trauma or just, you know, wasn't uh, mentally healthy or emotionally healthy. And that relationship became a trauma that redefined our system and might have sent a lot of mixed signals where or absent signals where it feel like they're bringing you close and then without notice just felt like they were sending you away and then again without notice may beckon you back and you know it's people in those kinds of relationships can also say it feels crazy making nobody can understand me <laughs> Absolutely. And then it's like, and you know, does the therapist catch it? Because if the therapist can catch it rather than get also caught up in that, then they can start to be able to kind of step in and make sense of it for both of them. Yeah. And then as you start to kind of make sense of it, you know, it's not just in the head, it's in the body. And then they, you know, there's the layers and layers of really taking that in and being able to both be different about it then. Yeah. And I know a lot of... Um culture sort of can be overly dismissive thinking well you're with a new partner who's healthy or you're not with that toxic person or you're away from that parent or whatever it, it should just be different like your brain should just be able to know the difference and I mean that's sort of really missing the heart of trauma and it's it really defines our relationship to other humans in general. And it's like our brain may know intellectually this is a different person. Maybe I can expect something different, but depending on how the trauma was made. And a lot of times these traumas can recapitulate themselves in different relationships. So you may end up finding yourself with people who repeat the same hurtful behavior and it just makes it so much harder to trust someone even when they are giving you what looks like secure attachment and i think that's the heart of that disorganization is that you know it's not put together in a way that our brain can make sense of and and have it clearly organized to where i know in not just my head but in my heart in my emotional center my nervous system that oh, I can trust this person that they are giving me something safe and I don't have to worry that it's just going to be yanked away like a yo-yo or someone ripping the rug out from underneath me again and I, I suppose for me it, it's like the, the, the system does get that there's something different here but it might be a millimeter or an, or a centimeter or or something like that you know of of like trust or hope or seeing that it's new but as a person starts to open up vulnerability it's like you get a you could get a flood mm. um so new stuff if you like starts to be able to be coming to the surface which is you know disturbed and distressed um, and starts to get triggered in the cycle. But it's it's partly getting triggered because they're allowing themselves to go to a new space. 
Yeah, that's so well said. So well said. And so let's also talk about why this is important in the context of couples therapy. And I'll be a little bit vulnerable and share that, you know, when I was a beginning EFT therapist, I, for some reason, trauma to me seemed a little compartmentalized. And I thought, unless somebody is specifically coming to you for trauma work, I sort of, oh, you have trauma. I'm just sort of putting this in a bin over here and I'm going to do the couple's work. I didn't realize at the time, again, I was a, a youngling. <laughs> so, you know, I didn't really recognize that you really can't compartmentalize. Like it just like, like soup, like Catherine Ream calls it a soup, <laughs> you know, it runs out everywhere. And, you know, I'm, I'm thankful for my clients and, and um, EFT to be able to learn that, you know, it really does impact everything. And so since I've learned, like, you can't just tuck it away in a compartment, you've got to bring it in because it's already in there. It's already a part. So can you talk a little bit more about that? Um, so, yeah, I mean, we all keep learning, don't we? So, yes, we, we can all look back and think, gosh, you know. What did I think then? Yes. Yeah. And we'll all look back in another five years and think, oh, <laughs> that's what I thought then. <laughs> it, that's one of the wonderful things about therapy is there's always so much more to learn. And I, I just love that. But uh, yeah, it can be a little bit daunting as well. Um, I think, you know, for me, it, it, it's like when I'm listening to people's histories and I'm listening to what's happening in their relationship, it, it will, you know, send off flags for me around people having trauma. So, you know, people having cycles where you can hear they they don't want to have the cycle go off. There's a sort of there's a difference for me with a couple who are essentially fairly, you know, it's fairly stable, fairly, you know, and a couple that have got a lot of trauma. Um, because they'll they'll probably be, be saying that they do get caught up in things that they don't want to get caught up in and they you know often will know that that doesn't actually belong with their partner um what i will often do that's that's um more, you know more clearly said with a trauma trauma couple is that i i will say i i need to be really collaborative with you i need us to work as a team and I need to figure out how how possible it is for that to happen um so for example you know I need to have your feedback on how you're finding sessions so that I can calibrate how deep I'm going and the pace that I'm going at and I said and that's not just about what's happening in the session it's about how you are after the session like I don't want this bouncing around reverberating and giving you a horrible week in between you know, I need your help. And I'll see how people respond to that and how they feel as if they might be. Because I've always got to also be aware that, you know, people might have that, you know, thing about, you know, they want to get it right for me. So they, you know, so I will say the way to get it right is to tell me how it is. Mm. Um, but I will still be cautious and I will still monitor it and, and, and you know, how, it, how able are they to tell me that after that session they had a really rough time. Yeah. Um, so that will be one thing that I will take much more care of um, in terms of really wanting to know how, you know, I'm going to pitch and pace, pace the session mm -hmm. um, and that we will go gently and that, you know, I, you know, I might even talk to them about, you know, the ways in which they might, you know, really trigger each other in terms of, of, of you know, their, their trauma and that I will be there kind of to catch those moments. Yeah. So I'll really be supportive and, and give them the clear message that I do know what I'm doing here and I will step in and I will help. I do know what this looks like. Good old EFT. Thank you so much to Sue for that clear and wonderful roadmap. And exactly. So I love what you're saying. So with double trauma, we're talking about, so you have a couple coming in and it's not just one of the partners that has trauma, but both of them. And so and of course, trauma plays a big part of the cycle because it it informs how we protect ourselves, where our our protections are, how we try to survive, what we're trying to survive from, like what our core threats and core fears are. And of course, you know, we're going to get caught triggering each other. And, you know, I love how Sue always said, like, you know, we want to be able to fight it together. And 
And I found with my double trauma clients that it was such a huge surprise to learn how they were inadvertently triggering each other's trauma. And it wasn't something they wanted to do. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. And it is like when you're in, you know, stage one and when there isn't trauma, trauma, what you often have is that at some point it just starts to really settle down. Yeah. That, People have both got triggered, but they, you know, the second one's got triggered by the, in reaction to the first one's behavior and such like. When they get where it's coming from, they can often quite quickly sort of step back and just, you know, wait for the therapist to, to do the work, if you like, and to hear it and to share it. And they, they don't feel the kind of, they can hold that sense of reactivity because it's just shifted because they get where it's coming from. Whereas when it's trauma, trauma, it's like the person, one person is is triggered and then the other one gets triggered as well into their stuff. Mm. So it, they're not able then to really stop. So one of the ways that you notice, you know, the trauma, trauma reaction in action is when it doesn't settle down in the same kind of way that they both still get quite powerfully triggered. Mm. And it, it's like it does settle but the, the place for me that that's, is, is really interesting is in late stage one, early stage two, when, you know, the cycle is calming down, but they can still get absolutely caught up in it with a trigger, trigger reaction and, you know, trauma, trauma. And they have some kind of understanding and compassion. They're, they're, they've, they've kind of come to terms with hope, which is a very fit, scary thing hope of change they want you know to step in with each other and they one of them starts to do it and then the other one does something that triggers them so i've got an example from from a wonderful couple that that i've worked with who came to me very specifically to work with 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 this kind of thing um so both of them having issues around i will never really be seen and heard and one of them then pushes and the other one goes into, I've got it wrong and disappears. So late stage one, a good understanding of this process. Yeah. And then, you know, the one um, coming in and saying, OK, this is new. You know, this is scary. Yeah, this is a new to say it this way to you, you know, but I want you to hear me about this. And the partner says, I'm here. Am I getting it right? And the other one says, see, he's not there. Yeah, much more powerfully than I'm saying it, of course. Mm -hmm. See, he's not there. Um, you know, it's about reassuring them again. Yeah, they can't be there for me. So why do I bother risking? And the other one is like, <laughs> they want me and I'm scared I'm going to get it wrong. And I just need them to help me help them. And it's all a mess. And they're both actually in a lot of distress. I'm just not very good at acting the distress bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it, it's like they see very quickly how the other one isn't there. They're in their own stuff in a way that, you know, I would say it's still fairly recent for me to see that and to just be able to absolutely get hold of it and say that is a trauma, trauma reaction and mm -hmm. I need to get hold of it and I need to kind of help them because you can imagine how as a couple start, to risk and then they have that happen it could be devastating mm. it could set them back so far yeah but actually being able to come in and say hang on hang on this thing has come and got you yeah look at it um it, it's like this isn't about you know you're not wanting to reach this isn't about you're not wanting to be there for each other but you've just both got caught up it's like it can make such a difference. And then you've got an analogy, you know, so, I, you know, I have an image, which is like, you know, there's two people on a cliff in a storm and they're both hanging on to a tree. Yeah. And they're both saying, come and help me, come and help me. And the other one is just hanging on for dear life as well. And it's like having images that work for them actually brings compassion for what's happening 
and enables them to kind of to sort of see that we are in this awfulness together. It's, you know, we want to get there, but it's the traumas that keep coming and taking us away. And that can help hold it from being a devastating thing. Yeah. Often I find for my double trauma clients, it's so relieving to understand the context of the trauma because they know, oh, this isn't me. This is our trauma getting away um, and and uh, being a part of this. And I've I've always said to my clients, and you don't have to be a part of the wound maker in order to be a part of the healer. And that's so empowering, you know, to the, to my clients. And I find, you know, with therapists, so let's talk about maybe pacing. So I, I do find myself often having to remind like supervisees that with trauma clients, especially double, double um, trauma, where each partner has trauma, you're going to have to go a lot slower than clients that don't have trauma and not to expect them to make progress at the same, you know, I mean, if trauma disorganizes us, one of the first things that we're doing is organizing that coherent baseline for them to sing to their amygdala, to soothe that amygdala till their amygdala amygdala can start to get that organized baseline. And that could take a while. Absolutely. They need a lot of support and a lot of support to actually kind of be able to see their trauma as something that comes and takes over and see that there's something different from that, which is about wanting to be able to be more vulnerable and to be able to be there and to receive the other and to be received. And I think it's one of those paradoxes again, isn't it, about you know, it really isn't about the the kind of the the linear way that you're going. It's like, you know, one of the things I love is to work in what I call small moments, small spaces. Mm-hmm. And I find them the richest places to work. And, and you're working, you know, suddenly in depth about something mm-hmm. tiny that just happened that you're unfolding. Um, so, you know, you have something happen, the other person responds, and it's like you take a little piece of it mm-hmm. and then you just stay with it and you just unfold it and unfold it. And suddenly you've got something amazing that kind of shifts and makes complete sense of why the person is reacting that way. And there's something in- incredibly stunning about doing that when you've got the trauma, trauma kind of mm-hmm. couple, because it's like they have the best will in the world to be there for each other and they get incapacitated um and by going into these small spaces and unfolding them it, it's like it just gives them bit by bit these safe safer spaces to be able to be with each other and themselves yeah and you said such a beautiful point about depth and i say in eft we're going over we're going for depth versus like geographical distance we're not circling the globe we're going for sunken buried treasure yeah yeah absolutely i mean just you know looking at, at one little piece of you know somebody saying you know why can't you ask me you know if it's okay to you know, go and, I don't know, open the door and leave it open in the summer. Um, and the other one, you know, but if I asked, you know, then you might say no. It's like you've got two stunningly beautiful places to go into. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you might spend half the session each, but getting curious together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's like, I'll go into anything like that, because to me, it's like, though everything has mm-hmm. action, reaction, and mm-hmm. it has something that we need to unfold. So you you get the, the whole of where each of that leads. And by the end of the session, you've got something amazing mm-hmm. to actually just have out there. Look at how this happens for the two of you, where you get so upset about something that on the face of it looks so small, but hey, it's not small, is it? Yeah. Yeah. Look at what it attaches to and look at what you've done today. It's been totally amazing, you know? Yeah. I think for a therapist that, that don't have trauma, their brain can get kind of anxious or their nervous system can get anxious about, am I doing it right? Because they're not moving so fast. And it's like, again, first rule of EFT is meet them where they're at and stay with them along that way. I mean, for us that have had, you know, 
secure attachment and our frame, our attachment system is organized, you know, we might not understand what it's like to live in a world where it's not just a one-time experience of disorganized attachment, it's experiences over time that disorganize the whole system. And so, I always say, think about us as in terms of like rehabilitation specialists, right? And we're rehabilitating their attachment system and their faith in humanity and their ability to trust, not just their partner, right? But humans in general. And so that consistency over time where we're organizing and organizing and organizing, maybe to a non-traumatized brain, it feels like, well, we didn't really do much, but to a traumatized nervous system and especially to having that organization over time is part of what helps that nervous system to start reorganize itself to safety. Like this is something I can trust. I can trust consistency over time builds trust. (laughs) Absolutely. I mean, this is the most transformational work because, you know, they really are fundamentally shifting their sense of you know their view of self and their view of other at an absolutely fundamental level they're reshaping their being in relation to the partner but also then the world so yes that can take time i mean this these are couples who might be with us for years or they might move from you know different therapists along the way but they might be there for years and yeah. that's absolutely fine mm-hmm now, so I'm imagining if therapists are watching this or thinking, what do I do in session if, you know, both partners trauma, like they trigger each other in session, which, mm-hmm. you know, I'm thinking even just a reactive couple, it's not not that much different from a highly escalated couple in early stage one. Exactly. I mean, in early stage one, that that's going to look very similar, isn't it? And you're going to use all of the usual ways of being able to kind of calm that down, whether that be literally stop or or whether that be kind of stepping in, in you know, with more verbal kind of exchange in terms of that. Um, it's more something that, you know, as they get an understanding of it, that they get the difference between what is trauma driven inside them and what is the person that they're growing into kind of now. Um, and I think that's the that's the, when it's really beautifully starting to shift, when they've got that kind of difference, the frustration, the challenge of that, the joy of that. And, you know, what we're talking about is, you know, we're not just talking about changing the relationship with the other. You know, we're talking about fundamentally changing the relationship with the self. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so beautiful. And I'm thinking, you know, something that I learned over time, and I don't know if this is necessarily like textbook or it's just something that I've come to understand from working with my double trauma clients is that even the traumatized parts, we have to engage re-engage the traumatized parts and so i know a lot of therapists get stuck like i don't know who's the pursuer who's the withdrawer and the trauma couples and i'm thinking you know again it's they're probably doing bits of both because you have disorganized attachment and you may not know their true baseline until we start working with some of the trauma and getting some organization so i find it's almost like you do a version of stage one and then you get to some withdrawal re-engagement with the traumatized parts. Now the traumatized parts feel like they can come forward without the trauma and they're engaging with emotions and their partner and themselves and the cycle in a whole different kind of way. And so I found you almost have to go back and redo your cycle work because it's going to change and then go back through. And I've just found it so normal. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's like, so people, there can be the disorganized attachment in there, or we might have, you know, the traditional quite clear pursuer withdrawer mm-hmm. because the traumas impact them in quite clear ways. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting you talking about that because I think that's why I, when I was talking earlier, I was talking about late stage one, early stage two, because, you know, I think there is that kind of space which is more marked with a trauma, trauma couple where, you um, you know, anybody, any couple can get re-triggered in their cycle, you know, all the way through, you know, Sue Johnson herself said, you know, she would, you know, get triggered with her husband. Um, So it's not about ever not having it, 
But right. I think with the trauma trauma couple, it might still get set off quite frequently because mm -hmm. as you start to let go of some of your about your your kind of um, protections, stuff starts bubbling up that that is you know your history. You know it it is your trauma. You know it is the impact of it. It is the fear, it is the risk, you know, that you're experiencing and letting yourself kind of go to that place with yourself and with the other. And so new stuff is arising and that new stuff then isn't processed fully yet. And so it may lead to some more triggering of that cycle as you go. So you can, you know, you can have done work for a long time and they can be actually in some ways very trusting of the relationship now and full of hope for it and yet still find themselves swept up and really upset you know so coming into a session you know we just had this incident and, and you know it's so upsetting after all the work we've done and really needing to do a lot of processing of how come that's come up now mm -hmm. and that it's because they're kind of it's actually a sign of increasing kind of trust and so mm -hmm. more you know yeah. more parts of the self are kind of emerging mm -hmm. that need some some care it's a sign of progress <laughs> yes yes and people you know really do respond at, at that point by that reframing of mm -hmm. this is going to happen yeah. it's like of course it is because mm -hmm. these new things are emerging and you've got what happens between the two of you on that mm -hmm. um and we need to, you know, how can we how can we help you sort of, you know, so it doesn't get too overwhelming as you do this journey. But, you know, you're yeah. on track. That's such a good point. Thank you. Thank you so much for saying that. Um, yeah, it's it's that. And then what I tell my clients often is like your brain is now said it's safe enough to deal with this stuff. You know, they're often they're like, how come this traumatic memory didn't come back earlier when we were trying to go over something? I say, well, your brain locked it away for a reason, right? And now it has enough safety that it's saying, okay, it now feels safe enough that we can start to deal with this. So it's starting to unlock some doors. You know, I kind of think of it as like, um, like, kind of corny Harry Potter, like the Chamber of Secrets, yeah. <laughs> you know, they start unlocking, you know. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and you don't know then, do you, as to how each of you is going to respond to what's un what's unfolding in the other. And it's like, while the person's looking for safety and security, it's like there's change in the self and the other. So that in itself can be disturbing. So, you know, it's like it takes time for it to, to start to feel safe enough for these things to uncover and for you to have your reaction and it not be, you know, an escalated cycle. Yeah. And I found most helpful in stage one is to keep making it explicit. This is where your trauma shows up and just keep making it. Here's your trauma again. Here's your trauma again. Here's your trauma again. And then eventually they're like, oh, this is my trauma, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Absolutely. You start to be able to kind of separate it out while also not making it something completely other. You know, it's like, yes, you do find it incredibly hard to, you know, feel safe. Mm. And yes, you know, you can feel safe like a bit. But, you know, even sort of helping people get that it's not an on off. You know, it's not a it's full full on or it's full off. That actually there are so many layers. Mm -hmm within you know safety and non-safety so you know being able to help people kind of make sense of it you know whether it's you know official psych ed if you like in terms of you know the books and the research or whether it's it's just being able to say of course yeah it's like there's another millimeter of safety in there yeah but it still feels really risky mm -hmm. and you're staying with the fact that it's really risky and that is in itself a sign mm -hmm. of becoming increasingly safe yeah yeah it's like being able to keep seeing the paradoxes that are within the kind of shift from the traumatic responses to healing them yeah so let's talk about maybe how our work would be sort of adapted maybe in terms of like goals or what we're aiming for doing couples work with double trauma clients i mean in general 
the goal of EFT is to just help our individuals and couples love and be loved in a secure and healthy way. And knowing that there's trauma involved for the double trauma clients, I think stage one, again, is helping them understand the impact, the role of the trauma in their cycle and their life and their protections and the relationship even blocks to feeling love or being able to love freely unencumbered and helping each partner to recognize their role and in inadvertently triggering their partner's trauma or, you know, filtering things through their own trauma lens. Again, just putting it front and center, which again can help them understand, oh, wait, this isn't me. I'm not, you know, broken in some kind of way. I'm not a good enough partner. It's not it. It's my partner's trauma. And now it makes it easier for me to take it a little less personally and I can be there for them. And, you know, we can start with intention, helping to show that care around each other's trauma. And, and in terms of, let's say when we transition to stage two and we are helping each other really open up some of these places and heal, can you talk about how we're shaping the role of this, the partners, each partner as a secure base and safe haven mm-hmm. within that storm of trauma? Hmm. I mean, in a way, it's no different, but of course, the nuances and the the depths of some of what we're talking about, the emphasis of some of what we're talking about is quite different. So when we're in stage two, what we're doing is we're still really clearly watching for the reaction of the other. Yeah, because, you know, if they haven't got, you know, all this trauma, they're much more likely to be, you know, a safe pair of hands to be able to receive the other one. They get, they get much more open and curious. You know, the withdrawer is much more present. The, you know, pers- pursuing partner is much calmer. Yeah, they they get really interested and engrossed in the work that you're doing with one. They get engaged in, you know, receiving, um, you know, in the step six, you know, that they're there. And obviously sometimes there's a bit of reactivity, but it's usually quite easy to calm it. When I'm in stage two with a trauma trauma couple, it's like we'll be really, really overt that as we're starting to talk, I would expect the other person at some point to potentially get quite triggered and that I would ask them to indicate that, yeah, and that we would then kind of work out what we needed to do. Because in stage two, you do much more. You know, in stage one, we do not have an expectation or requirement that the partner is really hearing the other one. We are the person who's kind of being that person much more. Yeah. So every In time fact, we're kind of assuming that they're not going to be that because yeah. of the nature of stage one. <laughs> exactly. So for a long, you know, for potentially a fair period of that, you're not in any way expecting that. Yeah. And in, in, in stage two, we are expecting that much more. It enables us to do the work, you know. But when we have the trauma, trauma couple, we need to be keeping watching out for that reactivity. And that reactivity, we we all now know as a team, is not because, you know, they're bad, they don't like them or anything else. It's because something is really knocking into something for them. And it's getting in the way then of them being able to attend to this and be part of it. So we might well have to pause and we might have to go to the other person and we might have to work out, you know, where's the best place for us to be working at the moment. You know, I'll often say to people, you know, what, you know, what are we working on today? We, you know, we might agree on what that is and they will always know because I'll be quite clear. This is where we'll start, where we go. I don't know how far we get with that subject. I don't know because what we're working with primarily is the process of what happens. Yeah. So you have to be careful with it as well, because it's like you can't have somebody sort of opening something up, but the other one reacting, you just flip over to the other person and do the work with them. Because the other person now isn't being able to hear. Yeah. And they feel, you know, like they've been dumped. We don't want to abandon the person who just took a risk. Exactly. So what I will often do is, again, I will catch the moment. Yeah. So Making the process explicit that just happened. Exactly. And I will stay with the moment rather than flipping, 
you know, mm. around between them. You're, you know, you're sharing this. And I get that this, there's something really new about what you're doing and that you're being vulnerable in this, yeah. And I'm hearing that for you, there's something in that that is just really setting you off, yeah. Let's just stay with this right now. Let's just stay with right now, yeah, because it's like I know you want to be able to be with them, but right now you're not able to be with them because you've just got triggered as well. Yeah, okay, so let's just pause. Let's just pause and let's just be with the fact that you've been sharing and you've got triggered. Yeah. How are we doing right now? And I would go to each of them with how they're doing. And I would spend time there. And we might spend a whole session there. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Depends. Depends what unfolds. Or it might be that something is said and we're able to proceed again quite quickly. You know, that the partner being heard is actually able to calm themselves and to say, you know, I'll come back to what's going on for me. Is that okay? Can we come back to it maybe next session? And yeah. they're able to hold it now. But it's like we we have to stop and do it. Whereas if we get caught by, you know, the content and the worry about, you know, is it this person or that person that I'm going to, we can get in a mess. That's yeah. why I like going into and making very clear an exact precise moment of what's just happening and unfold that. Right. Or maybe too rigid in the plan that we don't realize even by being flexible and staying with where they are and just maybe we need to micro process. We're still staying within the plan. We just may need to slice it thinner as we always like to say. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the place for us to focus on sometimes just really shifts and we just have to be cautious that we, know what we're doing rather than we're just getting flipped around you know in our panic if you like yeah yeah, yeah so before we wrap up something I'm hoping maybe you can touch on too is I often hear therapists get concerned and I, I find this more common with the trauma clients where we do need to maybe spend a session or so focusing on one partner, but they're concerned about, am I spending too much time working on one partner? And, and I know that there's ways to, you're still sort of working with both partners and on the re relationship to have, but can you speak to that a little bit more when we do need to spend more time, maybe even most of the session focusing on one partner? Mm -hmm. I think, you know, there's more tolerance for that as you continue to do the work and as they have a lot more trust in you as well as themselves and each other. So the capacity to do that builds up. And it, for me, it's about, um, be, you know, I've I've become much more overtly collaborative as, as I've kind of got into my work more. And I will literally be saying to clients, you know, so there's this theme that you both are agreeing is something that's really important to look at. Yeah, it's something that is really in, you know, more in one of you, but it impacts both of you. So how is it going to be if if we do attend much more today with the one? Yeah, we can balance it out by doing something more with the other next time. Yeah. Tell me how you're doing with that. So literally I would be asking them, how does that feel? How is it going to be if it gets difficult? Yeah. So it, obviously, if I was doing that for the 10th time, I wouldn't need to be doing it in quite such a clear right. way. We would, you know, we would have our shorthand for doing that. by Right. Then. right. But er, early on, I would just be really over and I would be saying, you know, this might be really difficult. You know, how are we going to deal with it if it is, mm -hmm. you know, and yeah, just and then do it and see how it is. And if it's, you know, being aware that, you know, just because the partner, you know, the listening partner has said, hey, I will find it difficult, but I'll find a way to manage it. Mm -hmm. It's like, doesn't mean that we have to hold them to that. Right, right. Yeah. Well, and it's too much, because the whole right. point about this is that they don't always know it's too much until right. they find it's too much. Right. Till they reach that edge of the window of tolerance. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and I know therapists have said, oh, it feels like I'm doing an e-fit session. And I know Sue historically has said this, this one of her things over time has been, if you can work with couples, by and large, you can also 
do individual work because there are times in session where it is appropriate. And, and I think therapists, again, because of the way our field is sort of indoctrinated people that know you can't do an individual session needs to be perfectly balanced. And that's not always realistic or feasible. And there are benefits to focusing on one person in session, but I always say some shorthand, easy um, things to do to help the other partner stay engaged is, you know, when you're doing the attachment frame and you're connecting the significance of the relationship and the partner, so you use their name, you reference them quite frequently that, you know, we love hearing the sound of our name. So it kind of pings our attention and yeah. engages us, but also they have a vested interest in hearing what's going on with their partner and they're witnessing and getting to know deeper parts of their partner, which is beneficial to the relationship. And they're watching us. We're modeling this secure attachment. And they're also learning vicariously ways to show up for and, and comfort and be there for their partner when these things get activated. Can you say more? Well, I think you said a lot of lovely things there, but I wanted to come back to the parts bit, which, you know, that we're doing in, in EFIT is, is, you know, one of the things that, you know, when you're in stage two that you can do beautifully is is go and make friends with the the child. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or the, or the different child parts that somebody has in their trauma. And that can be a beautiful connecting way of creating compassion for self and other is by attending to you know the, the the hurt child or the child that did all the coping and was then rejected by the growing person um, and actually being able to go close and to be able to kind of have them talk with their younger self and then get a response from the partner as to what it's like to, to start to get to know this person as what this part of the self as well and you know i've had some beautiful sessions where it's just been so emotional for them to be able to get hold of that and it also helps people then separate even more the trauma from you know the whole person that they love so much you know because they can see and have compassion for the part that got so traumatized um and yeah it done some absolutely beautiful sessions around that yeah, I've with my double trauma clients, I've, you know, even when I've had to spend, you know, a focus session leaning more with one than the other. But again, using these techniques, the other partners always said how incredibly helpful and healing it's been even for them to, they're able to put together, oh, this is why, you know, when I see certain things, this is where it's coming from. And now I have so much compassion and empathy. And now I want to make sure that I'm not the rejector and that I love them and help them. And it it's just been so healing and powerful for the partner to be a part of that. And they're front and center to be, you know, brought in and resourced as that um, safe haven, that secure base. Absolutely. And then they can also input on supporting the inner child, you know, that the child part as well, see when it is emerging and give give that child part some support. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it's it's like, often people want to feel as if I can do something. And, and somehow, when you get to that part of the therapy, there really are things that they can feel they can do. Mm hmm. Yeah, I've even had a few of them mention like, oh, through this, it makes me think of my own inner child and realize, wow, there's some wanting there too. And they're, oh, now I can have compassion for you and I can have compassion for me. And, you know, it's just, it's beautiful. It's it's so beautiful. I've just come to really love working with the traumatized clients too. It's just because the, the transformation is so yeah. incredible. Exactly. I mean, it, it really, I mean, I think of it with, with all of my clients, but with, with these clients as well, more than any, because the, the risks that they take, you know, the commitment that they have to open up to something new in themselves and each other is stunning. And, you know, to be invited to be the person to help shape that and hold that and be with them. I mean, it is, it's just so moving and gorgeous. And, you know, I grow as a human being through through being part of that. It really is just stunning. Yeah. So hopefully this will just serve like to kind of reassure the therapist, like, you know, that this is important, it's essential, and it plays a profound role in the healing process. So don't be scared or, 
you know, mm-hmm. worry so much. It's it's just normal and and um yeah, yeah. yeah. So well, Sandra, thank you so, so much. I mean, you've just shared so much wisdom. And now do you guys do you do workshops on trauma? Uh, I haven't done any yet, no. Um, um, I have, I've been focused a lot on externships and core skills because of doing it for Britain and Poland and the LGBTQ plus centred ones, but uh, certainly looking towards doing more continuing professional development courses, yeah. I would I would love to take a trauma training if you were to offer one. So that would be wonderful. Okay. So, well, so how can folks up there listening and they want to be able to find you or to be able to attend a training or maybe invite you to come to their area for training? How can they okay. find you? Okay. So uh, the main place would be on my training website. So that's um, www.acreefttraining.com acre from accessible responsive and engaged so mm-hmm. it goes straight across acre eft training um, and my email address is training at gmail.com yeah so, and i'll yeah, make sure I'll make sure to put the link for these in the description for the video on YouTube. If you're listening to this on podcast, you may just have to rewind and take a note. And now can they also access you through the British Center for EFT? Yes. Yes, I'm on there. So, yes. What's their website? So their website is www.beftcenter.org. B-E-F-T center. Perfect. Perfect. That way folks can find you. Can they email you through your sites? Perfect. Uh, yes, yes, yeah. There's the kind of, kind of connect up, uh, contact us bit of the website. Yes. Perfect. So Do you yes, have any projects me. or publications or anything that you're working on that folks could look at? So uh, I'm working on a couple of things. They're not published yet. So I'm part of the team working on lesbians and attachment. Uh, which is uh, something that kind of complements um, Robert Allen's one that he did on gay men and and attachment, and he's part of that team. And then um, the first LGBTQ plus ex- centred externship we ran in London in 2022, we did a team of us did some research on that. Um, and so uh, we're just finalising writing that up and then sending it out for publication. And that is, is yeah, that's a real passion of mine. It's been fascinating to get feedback from um, the participants around just how much it meant to have an LGBTQ plus centred training. Yeah, beautiful. Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. So folks could look you up and maybe they want to have an LGBTQ centred externship or training in their area. They could reach out to you and talk about how to make that happen, which would be wonderful. So perfect. Well, thank you so, so much for just being with us today and, and sharing your time and your wisdom with us. Thank you very much for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. Wonderful. And thank you so much to our viewers. We hope that you're enjoying what you hear. And I'm always open to hearing more topic ideas. You guys keep them coming. And make sure that you guys hit subscribe because more videos are on the way. Don't forget to buy my book, Using Relentless Empathy in the Therapeutic Relationship, Connecting with Challenging and Resistant Clients for Helping Professionals. Available on Amazon or on my website, www.drbugatti.com.